What's up guys, it's Carlos from New Horizon CA and today is a very special how-to video. We will be presenting how to lower your C8 if you have the Z51 performance package. The how-to will cover both your front and rear suspension and will also cover how to install lowering collars if you have the front lift option. If you have magnetic right suspension, we'll also be going over how to depin your magnetic ride connector properly so that you can disassemble your front suspension to do that process. If you're looking to take that big step in working on your C8, this is a great place to start. We'll break down the process step by step for you, give you tips along the way so that it makes your job not only easier, but a much more satisfying experience. We'll show you all the tools that you're going to need, some extra tools that might make your job a little easier, as well as a couple of vital tools and parts that you don't want to start without, so you don't want to miss that. It's a great and satisfying how-to video today, so let's get started. So thank you for tuning in. If you like what you're hearing so far, please consider hitting that subscribe button and clicking on that bell so you know when the next cool video drops. So before starting with this how-to, it's important we make a few distinctions of what parts and tools you'll need to lower your C8 depending on the sort of options you have. The best way I could break down what options and parts or tools for the job are needed was through this chart. If at first it seems a bit overwhelming, the big point is to find your C8 configuration that matches the one on the left column. If you have a non-Z51 C8, the only main option is to lower using lowering springs as the suspension is not a coilover. This will require taking both the front and rear suspension off the car to install, but can follow a reasonable amount of this how-to video on the process. This master guide will be more focusing on those with the Z51 option and looking at the options with both mag ride and front lift, which require the use of all the aftermarket parts and tools to accomplish. If you have other configurations, this how-to will cover you as well and just simply means that certain steps or processes don't apply during your installation. One big emphasis is the time commitment to do this lowering for both the front and rear. Typically for an expert or someone who's familiar with doing suspension work, this job would typically take an hour and a half for the rear suspension and about two to three hours on the front suspension if needing to be taken out to work on. That being said, if this is your first time ever performing such a job on your C8 or any car for that matter, I would recommend splitting this effort in both doing the rear suspension first one day and the front another day as this effort can take two to even three times longer than an expert doing it. For me, it took an even longer time since a majority of my lowering job was in crazy hot Texas weather with temperatures above 100 degrees in my garage, all while trying to film it for this how-to. Point being is that you can break out the process into two main parts, one for the rear suspension and one for the front. You can even drive your CA with the rear lowered and not have your front yet done without the worry of damage as I had done that, splitting the job between two weekends with no issues. So with that being said, we'll start with the rear suspension lowering how-to as the process is a bit simpler and can help get you comfortable with the job. So for this first portion of the video, the tools that are needed are less than that for the front if you're installing lowering collars. If you have the Z51 option without the front lift option, this guy will cover both your front and back suspension as the overall process is identical for all four wheels. What you'll need is a 22 millimeter socket, breaker bar, duct tape, brake cleaner or similar, two small flat head screwdrivers, the Paragon Performance coilover wrench set, a 3 8 inch drive wrench or breaker bar, a jack lift, and a jack stand. Some optional tools that may end up making your life easier can be an impact driver with a socket adaptation for the 22mm socket, a file, spring compressors, some jack pucks, and a rubber sleeve for the jack stand. How these optional tools will be useful will be explained throughout the guide. So to start off, the first thing we need to do is lift the section we are lowering and remove the wheel. Using a breaker bar and a 22mm socket, loosen the lug nuts to the wheel before beginning to lift using the jack lift. 
If you're planning to use an impact driver to loosen the lug nuts, you can skip this step and move straight to lifting the car up. To lift the car up, place your jack lift over the section where the red jack puck is, or if you don't have one installed, locate the slotted hole and place there. The jack pucks aren't required, but do make it easier and more consistent on where to lift if you're doing this process often. Once the car is lifted, you can place a jack stand next to your jack lift for extra protection. I also use a rubber sleeve on top of the metal point. It's not necessary, but it does reduce the risk of damaging plates underneath the car, as well as help reduce the chance of the jack shifting. Place your jack stand underneath and next to the jack. Lower your jack lift so that the stand is taking on the majority of the work and not the lift. After which you can go ahead and begin removing the lug nuts to remove the wheel. Again, if you're using an impact driver, you can start at this point to removing the lug nuts. Why I mention all of this is mostly due to my experience where the lug nuts were so over torqued, most likely from use it with an air gun set too high, I couldn't break the torque with a normal breaker bar and I risked stripping the lug nuts. The impact driver was a much easier process to break that initial tightness and may be necessary in your case, so keep that in mind. With the lug nuts removed, you can now remove the wheel. So now with the wheel removed, we have our first look at the suspension and the main parts involved on lowering your C8. This will include the spring which we're lowering, the plastic sleeve covering the threads, and the upper and lower locking perch. To start, we need to remove the plastic sleeve to expose the threads. Using the two small flat head screwdrivers, insert the flat heads between the plastic sleeve and the lower perch to pull down as you rotate the plastic sleeve in order to remove. Using flat heads that are as thin as possible will make this job easier. The goal, which is more obvious after removal, is trying to push the sleeve under the metal lip of the lower perch as you rotate the sleeve to remove it. Once done, you want to place duct tape under where the exposed threads are. This will help keep the lowering strut from spinning as you're making the adjustment and prevent any damage should you need to use vice grips. At this point, we're ready to start using the Paragon coilover wrenches. A special feature of these instead of normal coilover wrenches is the 3 8 inch adapter to increase the leverage while you're using the tool. While it most definitely made the job easier, I did find that my ratchet did not fit the slots given, even with me caveman stomping them in place, and had to take a file to remove metal in order for it to fit. It wasn't a lot I needed to remove, but it was enough to make a file necessary for my case. From an engineering perspective, I think the modeling overall dimensions were correct for the, a good tight fit, but with painting, it may have been made it too tight. This could have been the case or a general quality miss on my specific part. Either way, not a really big deal as afterwards it didn't diminish the usability of the wrenches and worked just as intended. To use them though, match the tab from the wrench with a slot on either the upper or lower perch to turn the perch in the desired direction. First we need to unlock the lower perch from the upper which requires utilizing both wrenches. Place in the smaller wrench on the lower perch and the larger one on the upper. Turn the lower perch to the left to release the tension and allow it to spin freely. This will require a little bit of force, but you shouldn't need to use the extensions for this part. After which, you'll want to spin the lower perch down the threads to the desired level. Also, a quick side note, when lowering your C8, you'll see a bit more threads exposed than what I'm showing initially. This is because I refilmed this part of the video to take advantage of better lighting. I had reset the height, but didn't go all the way to the original factory height since I was working in blazing hot Texas weather, and it was above 100 degrees in my garage for most of this install. Anyways, to get to the meat of this lowering, you'll now take your larger wrench and begin lowering the top perch down to the lower perch position. If you're looking for max drop with the Z51 coilovers, leave one thread exposed underneath the perch, which will give you approximately a 0.7 inch drop. This is where in most cases it will require the use of that extension to gain the extra leverage. You may need to hold the bottom of the strut in place from spinning as you're rotating and may or may not need to use a vice clamp to hold it in place. That being said, you want to use a wrench or breaker bar that has a low profile driver. The reason is because without the leverage arm being perfectly in line with how you're rotating, the wrench has a tendency to twist in your hands and can slip as you're twisting. The more in line with the wrench, the easier of a time you'll have lowering this. This is the most physically demanding part of the process, so you'll want to take your time and make sure your tabs and slots are aligned properly each twist to prevent this from slipping. There are other methods to make this process easier such as using spring compressors on the spring so that it provides a slight amount of tension relief 
and allows the top perch to spin freely. I did this on one side of my rear suspension, which did help significantly, but I need to add a big warning to that because of the potential clearance problems. Especially the top cap of the suspension, you can potentially run the risk of damaging your suspension if you compress the springs too much and the long bolt from the spring compressor start pushing through that top cap. It might not be the case in your situation depending on what brand of spring compressor you're using, but if you decide to use that, just keep in mind where that compression bolt goes and it's not pushing on any vital components accidentally. Once you've brought down your top perch to the lowering position, you can do a quick twist of the lowering perch to get the initial tighten and then use both to do the final locking. You shouldn't need to use the extensions in this case either and should only need to use enough force that you can't move the perches any further. After which you can then remove the duct tape you had placed earlier and use brake cleaner or similar to remove any adhesive that's left. Once clean, you can then reinstall the plastic sleeve back on the lowering perch. To do this, take your flathead screwdriver and push up on the sleeve to reinstall above the lip as you're rotating the sleeve. At this point, you've lowered that suspension and can place the wheel back on. Place the lug nuts back and begin doing an initial tightening in a star pattern. You're not torquing down just yet, but just getting the wheel positioned correctly. I use a two finger method with my breaker bar in a star pattern and go through all the lugs at least twice. The two finger method means I'm just using two fingers to tighten the lug nuts instead of my whole hand and arm. This just makes sure that I'm not over tightening without using a proper torque wrench, but tightens enough to ensure that it's aligned properly before lowering. Once that's done, you can raise the jack lift to be able to remove the jack stand. And once the jack stand is removed, you can then lower the car gently. Finally, take your torque wrench and torque the lug nuts in a star pattern to 140 foot pounds and you're done with this side. With this, you can then repeat the process on the other side and your front suspension if you don't have front lift and are lowering using this method. So moving on to the lowering of the front suspension, the process can be a little bit more involved, but definitely more satisfying. So getting into our tool list, there's one really important extra part that you should make sure you have beforehand, and it is an OEM GM washer for the banjo bolts used on the front lift system. The process means replacing the used washer when we disconnect the front lift. These washers are a one-time use because they crush to create a perfect seal for the hydraulic line. If you don't, you run the risk of the front lift system leaking when finishing your lowering. So this is something I really recommend and I'll have links in the description below on where you can order that. Now that being said, the basic tools you'll need are as follows. Also. Here are the Paragon tools that you'll need as well. In addition, here are some optional tools that will also make this job easier. So to start with this front lowering, first place some wheel chokes on the rear wheels. This is mostly necessary if you're working on an incline. Next is to remove the trim line on the front trunk. There are three main panels that need to be removed. First, we need to remove the side trim panels. To do this, pull on the end and middle of the trim panels to release from three clips holding it in place. Next, you can remove the main panel. There are five total tabs holding it in place. Four are located on the corners of the trim, while the fifth is located near the drain vent located on the center. Release all five clips and remove the panel. Next, we can remove the mag right connectors on both sides of the front suspension. Use a flathead screwdriver to unclip the connector from the top of the strut. Afterwards, you can pull the red tab back to allow the connector to be unplugged. Use a flathead to push down on the black tab and unplug the connector. It's a bit hard to release, so the flathead will make that job easier to unplug.
Next, we can begin removing the top hat nuts holding the top strut cap of the suspension on both sides. You want to use a 13 millimeter socket plus three inch extension to remove. Since the nuts are in some pretty deep wells, the nuts may fall off the threads and be hard to reach. In this case, a magnet pickup tool or needle nose pliers can help. While you're removing the nuts, it's important that you leave one nut installed but only hand tight to keep the suspension in place until ready to remove. Next, we can begin lifting the car. Use the car jacks to lift from the slot locations just behind the front wheels. The location to lift is the same as where the jack pads would be installed on your C8. The goal is to lift the car enough to place jack stands on the location behind the main lift location. This spot is meant to be a tie down location, but it's structural and can be used in this specific case since we're only lifting the front. If you're planning to lift the car in one shot, you want to make sure you, that the jack stand is closer to where the jack lift location is, so you distribute the loading evenly. Once you have placed the jack stand, slowly lower the lift to the stand. The car may rock slightly. This is okay so long as the jack is not sliding from the location placed. The car will end up stable underneath the jack stands once the other jack is placed. Repeat the lift on the other side and place the jack stand similarly. Unlike lifting the rear suspension, we need to lift the front on both sides in order to be able to gain the clearance needed to remove the suspension. Once you've finished placing the jack stands, you're ready to start working on lowering the front. If this is your first time lifting or working the front of the car and are worried about how stable it is, you can rest easy. If you place the jack stands in the correct location, I can tell you that the car is very stable and will handle any kind of work or pushing that will be needed to work on the suspension. Now we can look at removing the wheels. Use a 22 millimeter socket to remove the lug nuts from the wheel. Using an impact driver makes the process much easier. If you're using a breaker bar, make sure to loosen the lugs before lifting the car. So now that we have the wheels removed, we can take a first look at the hub assembly. In order to remove the suspension strut, we will need to perform four actions. We need to remove the main bolt connecting the suspension to the bottom control arm, the banjo bolt holding the front lift hydraulic line, the connector to control the front lift module, and finally to remove all the top hat nuts. First, we'll take care of the connector. Since the front is lifted and the wheels taken off, we can rotate the hub assembly for better access. It's stiff and requires a bit of muscle to push back and forth, but should rotate freely. So this connector is similar to the Mag right connector we disconnected earlier and has a red clip that must be pulled back where a black tab can then be pushed to unplug the connector. Once you have removed the connector and placed it aside, we can move onto the banjo bolt holding the front lift hydraulic line. You'll want to place a drip pan underneath as the line will leak once you remove the assembly. If needed, using a 3 inch extension drive will help you as well. Once that is removed, we can then move on to the main bolt and nut, connecting the strut to the control arm. Use the 21mm open wrench and socket to accomplish this. 
You'll need to use a breaker bar to loosen the bolt initially. Once it's loosened, however, from its initial tightness, it will be easier to just use a regular ratchet with an open wrench to get the nut fully removed. Having the adapters from the half inch to the 3 8 inch can help in this matter so you can still use that 21 millimeter socket. Once the nut is freely loose, you can remove that and focus on taking the bolt out. To remove the bolt, you may need to push down on the hub assembly to allow the bolt to push out with less effort. I had to put my full weight behind the hub assembly in order to make this happen, so don't be afraid to put some muscle in pushing down on the assembly to accomplish this. Last thing we need to remove is the remaining top hat nut that we left on previously to allow for full removal. Once that last nut is removed, the strut is ready to be removed. To do this, you want to swing the bottom of the strut up and out of the way. This will take some effort, especially if you've never done this before. The key is to keep in mind of the clearances of the bottom strut and spring as you're trying to remove. Make sure to rotate the hub assembly as needed to gain the clearance on the bottom strut as well as pushing down on the hub assembly to remove. Be patient and take your time as this may require a few tries before it comes out if you've never done it before. Once you've successfully removed the strut, pat yourself on the back because that was the hard part, at least for me. From there, we can take a look at the strut assembly. So the strut assembly consists of the magnetic ride connector, if you have that option, rubber grommet, top hat nut, strut top cap, bump stock, spring, bump stop cap, front lift unit, main shock, and the OEM collar which we're looking to replace. So if you're installing lowering collars, we need to work our way from the top to the bottom in order to replace this collar with the new ones. So before we start with the removal, we need to make sure and mark each section for alignment. This will be really important when we reassemble. If you're finding your Sharpie, or in my case, just a really bad marker, is not keeping its mark, use some painter's tape or similar to leave marks you can refer to later. Next we come to the fun part and it's deep pinning the magnetic ride connector if you have that option. If you don't have mag ride on your C8, all you'll see is a top hat nut and can bypass this part of the how-to video. To remove the mag ride connector, first we need to remove the back shell. Use a small flat head screwdriver to loosen the tabs and remove. A regular flat head may not work in this case and I found a flat head used for glasses or similar is the right size for this part. Once you remove the back shell, we can now look at deep pinning this connector, and for this, we'll use the deep pin tool from Paragon Performance. So I found there was a lot of confusion on how to properly use this tool and deep pin the connector, where I've heard people taking an hour or even longer to deep pin, when the process should actually take less than five seconds if you know how it works. So to help everyone, I thought it would be a great opportunity to bust out some engineering tools and model this connector to help better show what's going on inside and how to deep pin this connector quickly and without causing damage. So this connector has essentially four main parts to it. You have the main plastic shell, a pink retainer clip that holds the pins in place, and finally the two pins inside the connector. The retainer clip can shift from left to right depending on if it's in the locked or unlocked position. The key to removing the pins first is to ensure the two main slots in the retainer clip are aligned underneath the two pins. From there, we'll make half of the shell transparent to help show the inside as we take the D-pin tool and insert it into the connector. We can then take our D-pin tool model and show how it's used properly. When inserting the D-pin tool, the end will go into the slot that's been aligned underneath the pin. To make the visualization even easier, we can just show half of the connector to expose how the D-pin tool is working with the pin itself. On the actual pin itself is a spring clip that helps hold the pin in place. The D-pin tool, when inserted, can reach this pin spring and press in to allow the pin to be pulled out. If you're wondering how deep you need to insert the tool to reach the spring clip, the ridge on the D-pin tool is actually the marker to let you know. Once there, you'll simply be applying an upward pressure on the pin tool to push the spring in. This motion will unlock the pin to allow you to pull the wire out. So in one action, as you're pushing the spring in, you want to pull that specific pin out. Once the pin is out, you'll repeat the same process to pull the other pin in the connector. 
If you're wondering how hard do I need to pull the wire to unplug the pin, the best way I can think of it is this. With your fingertips, take a few strands of your hair from your head. If you're pulling the wires with the same force as you're pulling your hair and it hurts to pull, you're pulling too hard. It should be a relatively light pull to release the pins if the spring is pushed in properly. There's also a second way to pull the pins out where you're removing the retainer clip out of the shell first, but I would not recommend this as you can run the risk of damaging the clip and is frankly the same process but adding an extra step. If for any reason the retainer clip does come out, simply slide it back in focusing on the two tabs to go through the alignment holes until it locks into place. Now that we've gotten past the mag ragged connector, we can focus on disassembling the rest of this strut. First remove the rubber grommet to expose the top hat nut. Once that's done, you'll then be installing the spring compressors. To install, place each compressor equally apart, trying to cover the springs as shown. Ensure the pins are secured and you're ready to start compressing. At this point, we can tighten the spring compressor using either a breaker bar or an impact driver to accomplish this. The process can be done with a breaker bar, but it's much easier with an impact driver. The springs don't need to be compressed a lot, just enough to relieve the tension on the top and bottom of the strut assembly. Work small bits of compression on each side until it's loosened from the assembly. Once that's done, we can now look at removing the top hat nut from the strut cap. If you have the mag ride option, you'll need to use the mag ride socket to allow for removal with the mag ride cable freely out of the way. To loosen, you'll need to hold in place the bottom and top of the strut assembly from spinning. In this case, clamps may be helpful to hold as you're loosening the top hat nut. I found an easy solution by using my impact driver to do the initial loosening. I make a big emphasis on initial loosening. It's just to break the initial tension of the nut. Once done, the removal of the nut is a lot easier and should be done via a ratchet or by hand. Once that's done, you can remove the top hat nut and the remaining pieces are an easier removal piece by piece. One thing to keep in mind is that the bump stock may come out along with the spring. Not a big deal, but something you'll need to get out and install separately when you get to that point. From there, you can remove the bump stop cap by shifting the front lift module back and forth. You don't need to use a lot of effort, otherwise you'll do the same thing I did and shoot that cap off by accident. Finally, you can reach your OEM collar to remove and replace with a Paragon lowering collar. And that concludes this how-to. I hope you enjoyed. No, totally joking. That's all to leave a person hanging like that. So getting back on track, so essentially we need to just reinstall everything but going in backward order. First, place back the front lift module. At this point, you want to make sure that your alignment lines you drew earlier are st all still there. If needed, redraw them so that you know where to reference them later, as this will be really important to getting the strut back on the car properly. Next, we can install the bump stop cap. To do this, place the cap over the shock and tap down with a mallet. There are dimples on the shock that must be covered by the cap to make sure that it's fully seated. After which the bump stop can be placed back on. If you're deciding to also place lowering springs, you may need to trim the yellow foam plastic to allow for clearances. If not, just install as normal. Next you can reinsert the spring, again keeping in mind the alignments you made earlier. Once done, place the top strut cap ensuring the alignment is kept and install the top cap hat nut as well. Again, use the mag ride socket to do your tightening if you have the mag ride wire in the way. So I will say for this part, you wanna make sure you do as much of your tightening before decompressing the springs as it will make it easier to do the final torque down. In this case, clamps may help in holding the top and bottom in place as you tighten. Obviously don't over torque, but this will make it that you don't have to do a bunch of realignment under tension once the spring is decompressed. Once you have things tightened down, you can then begin decompressing the springs. 
You'll want to decompress in small sections and ensure that the bottom rubber piece seats evenly on the top cap. Once the spring compressors have been removed, torque the top hat nut to 24 foot-pounds. Afterwards, you can then reinstall the rubber grommet and begin putting the mag ride connector back together. The process to repin the connector is pretty straightforward. The two main things to ensure is that this pin spring is facing downward on the connector while you're inserting the pin. The second is ensuring that it's fully seated and making sure none of the green rubber seal is sticking out and giving a light pull to make sure the pin is secure. The wires themselves are not interchangeable, so you need to make sure that you're inserting the pins properly on the right sides. Afterwards, you can reclip the back of the connector shell and it's ready to be installed on the CDA. To reinstall the strut back on the car is essentially the same process as taking out, but in reverse order. As you're placing back, you want to make sure that the top cab threads are aligned as you're moving the bottom strut up and over into position with the control arm. Again, this may take some effort and a few tries. It may require the use of your body weight to push down on the control arm to reinsert. Once done, you'll want to push down again using your body weight to help line up the hole for the bolt that needs to be reinserted. Once the bolt is in, you can reinstall the nut and torque down to 118 foot-pound. Next thing to do is reinstalling the hydraulic line for the front lift system. This is where I will say it's extremely important that you use a new GM banjo bolt washer. These washers are designed to be a one-time use only part and because they are designed to be crushed as pressure is applied to make a perfect seal. There are alternatives that can be bought at auto stores if you're in a tight spot and don't have any time for your install, but I wouldn't recommend them since you can't guarantee the correct thickness and sealing ability. Installing the previously used washers is also a huge roll of the dice since they are completely deformed, especially the washer that sits up on the strut. If the seal is not perfect, you run the risk of the front lift hydraulic line leaking and can potentially cause damage not only to the system itself, but now allow your car to lift when you need it. Depending you may need to use vice grips and your 11 millimeter socket to twist the washers off since it comes off so deformed. That being said, when you reinstall the line, make sure that there is a washer on either side of the hydraulic line when placing the bolt. Reinstall the banjo bolt with the line at a 45 degree angle that is made by the end connector and torque down to 30 foot pounds. Next, you can replug the front lift connector. It's a simple plug which should give you a snapback into place where you can then slide the red tab forward to lock in place. Next, you can retighten all the top strut tower nuts and torque those down to 22 foot-pounds. Afterwards, you'll then want to replug the mag ride connector and reattach the top strut and you're done with that side. All that's left next is to do the same thing for the other side. The first time going through will obviously take longer than the second time working the other side. Once both sides are done, you can then reinstall the wheels on the front. Do your initial tightening of your wheels in a start pattern to make sure they're aligned properly, but don't torque down until the car has been taken off the lift. Now we can take the seat off the lift, which requires using the jack lift to lift slightly and remove the jack stand from that side.
Repeat the process on the other side and the car is now off the lift. From there we can do a final tightening of the lug nuts. Make sure you torque down the lug nuts on the front wheels to 140 foot-pounds using a star pattern to ensure even tightening. So nearing the end, one of the final steps is to refill the hydraulic line for the front lift system, which is located on the left side and has a symbol for the front lift. You'll want to use DOT4 brake fluid, and I found that a 12 ounce bottle will do the job. Once that's filled and the cap reinstalled, you can now reinstall the trim panel, starting with the center piece and then attaching the side pieces. And with that, the very last thing to do is to test the front lift system and bleed the line. To do this, all you have to do is go through lifting the car using the front lift button three to four times and you'll be ready to go. It's normal to hear the hydraulic motor making different sounds than you're used to as bubbling and such are being removed from the system. And with that, you're done with lowering your C8. If you have any questions about this how-to or things you'd like to see on the next how-to, please feel free to leave a comment below. So thanks again guys for tuning in. If you liked what you saw, please go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button. Let me know in the comments what you'd like to see and we'll see you next time.